thanks to everybody at Shirley Hines for all the work you do preserving nature and making it available to all of us. And thanks to everybody out there for all you do for nature, supporting your local land trust, supporting the Nature Conservancy, buying environmental license plates, working on restoration projects, or most important of all, just visiting nature preserves. If we don't visit nature preserves, then uh, there's not much impetus to save nature. So the title of our presentation this evening is The Mighty Stature and Ecology of Oaks. Their future doesn't look bright, but we can help. And that title is a bit of a roller coaster there. It starts out on an upbeat, then it gets down into a downer, and then it ends on a high note. So let's look at our three goals on this roller coaster ride. Our first goal is why should we care about oaks, their mighty stature and their ecology? Our second goal is how did oaks come to be so common and widespread in the Eastern United States? And then third, what problems do oaks face and what can we do to help? So let's get right on the roller coaster. And first of all, let's address why should we care about oaks? First of all, oaks as a group are our national tree. They're a symbol of strength and aesthetically they're so appealing. Whenever I'm near an oak, I always feel really good. Perhaps most important of all is their ecological importance. Nearly everybody knows about the importance of acorns to birds and mammals and even insects. They're vitally important for so many animals, but also many invertebrates feed on the leaves, even though oaks have some pretty good chemical and structural defenses to reduce uh, herbivory, lots and lots of insects have gotten around that to a degree and they can feed on the leaves and therefore those insects then feed birds and many other species. The oaks also prov provide browse, which is the fresh grown twigs that various grazing mammals can eat. They have great structure in their stem and their branches and gnarly branches that give life niches for all kinds of organisms. And then old trees develop cavities in which organisms can be. A, a recent report found the endangered spotted turtle living in a cavity in the base of, a, of an oak tree. Who'd have thunk that? And then because oaks let a lot of sunlight down, lots of herbaceous and shrub species can grow underneath oaks, helping a whole bunch of other species. So oaks are unparalleled in their ecological importance. And I urge you to learn more about how important oaks are. It's gonna be kind of chilly the next 10 or 12 days. So maybe get uh, snuggle up in your living room, turn on YouTube on your TV and do a search for Doug Tallamy and look at his many, some of his many webinars on ecology, and he'll blow your mind with how important oaks are. Once you've seen some of those videos, if you haven't already, read his book, Nature's Best Hope, which is one of the five best nature books ever written. And he has a book then on oaks as well. the nature of oaks. So you'll really learn a lot about oaks. There are more than 30 species of oaks in the eastern U.S. The Chicago wilderness area has at least 10. They live on all soil types from clay to sand, dry to wet. They have high quality of wood for our economy, for flooring, cabinets, furniture, and many other things. Because oaks live so long, they provide community stability for the ecology and the ecosystem. They, because they can be so big, they can sequester lots of carbon emissions that we're all guilty of, but their future is uncertain, uh, and that's largely due to us. Well, we've finished the first topic already. So in a Jim Gaffigan-like uh, audience aside, you're probably saying, hey, this is going to be over before we know it. Maybe we can get to the lemon tree for some carryout. What do you want? You know, I'll have falafel. How about you, chicken kebab? Uh, so, but I will say the next two goals are going to take a little longer to accomplish, but we hope to still get you to the lemon tree if you want uh, to get there. Well, let's look at the oaks and we're gonna focus on the Eastern United States. And oaks are found occasionally in the prairie, the prairie being defined as zero to 10% canopy. There are occasionally a baroque in the prairie. Savannas then have 10 to 30% canopy and those are mostly oaks. Some people say 10 to 50%. 
Woodlands can be 30 or 50% to 90% canopy, and those are a lot of oaks, as we'll see. And then forest oaks are still important, even though the canopy cover is much higher. So keep this gradation from prairie to forest in mind. And here we can see a big section of the tall grass prairie in brown. Some of it extended up into southern Canada, some of it extended down into Texas. So this is the bulk of it. But all these interdigitating white areas here are this gradation from prairie to savanna to woodland and then further in to forest. And you can see it's very complex around the perimeter. And as you get further in, then you get more forest habitat, except for where it's been largely cut down. So how do we get this gradient? It's due in part to climate, but it's also due in big part to fire. The areas that are now or were historically prairie, got the highest frequency of fire. Savannah's got a little less frequent fire, woodland a little bit less, and forest a little bit less than that. But fire is essential to the maintenance of this gradient. We mentioned earlier that oaks are found on a variety of soils and conditions. Some are specialists on very dry soil, as this Ohio State slide shows. Some are on more medium or mesic soil, although some of these like white oak and black oak and chinkapin can get into pretty dry soils. And then some like really wet soils. So oaks are found in all basic forest woodland niches. Now in understanding oak and forest woodland ecology, we have to consider two factors almost simultaneously, the tolerance of the tree species to fire and the tolerance of the tree species to shade versus sun. On the gradation from fire tolerant, oaks are, as we'll learn, extremely fire tolerant. They can survive fires very well. If they are top killed, if their stem is killed, they can sprout from the roots. Hickories, black cherry, sassafras, and pines intermediate, and then beech, maple, basswood, and tulip tree, very fire intolerant. They're easily killed, although some of them can sprout. On the other grade, gradation, we have the shade tolerant species such as beech, the maples, red and sugar maple, basswood, intermediate, and then also oaks in the shade intolerant. We have to look at these two gradations and we can consider them as a big X because many of the species that are fire intolerant are shade tolerant. Forming a diagonal like this, many of the species that are fire tolerant are shade intolerant. So got to keep those pieces of phraseology uh, straight as we go through this. Let's look at where the oak diversity is. The greatest oak diversity in the 48 states is in the southeastern quadrant with usually in the teens a number of oak species. This declines as you go north to about a dozen in our area, drops down to one or two in the northern Great Lakes area and northern New England. Parts of Arizona have a few species, parts of California do, but those are very different systems. So we're gonna focus on the Eastern US. Mexico, Doug Tallamy tells us, has 200 species of oak. So if you're reincarnated with the option of being an oak biologist in Mexico, one of us ought to take that. Let's look at how common oaks were in the Eastern US. In this central hardwood region, about half the forest area had an important oak component. South of that, pines joined the oaks and were very important. But as you get to the coastal plain in Florida, pine becomes much more common and the oaks become a bit more scrubby. So we're gonna focus on these oak areas and the Northern Great Lakes and New England. Just looking at white oak, we can see that in the darker the color here, the more important white oak is in the forest. And we can see the Ozarks into that central hardwood region through West Virginia and Pennsylvania, they're incredibly important. Also in the transition from the prairie to the forest arcing like this in the Great Lakes region. So white oak is uh, one of the most important. And here's its basic range and it's important ecologically, but it's also, harvested extensively. Its initial value in the early 1800s was largely in parts of the lower parts of building cabins, wagons, ships, and war items. Later values, furniture, cabinetry, whiskey barrels, you know, that's one of their big, they're perfect for whiskey barrels, caskets, rail ties, and so on. So there's an intense logging effort uh, on oaks and especially white oak. Now let's get to the point where we talk about how did these oaks become so 
common and abundant in the eastern half of the United States. <clears throat> and let's focus on uh, Indiana for starters, since many of us are from Indiana, we have to consider the glacial periods here in the uh, last couple of million years, and especially the last four glacial periods. The furthest south that the glaciers went was this line right here. So this blue zone never got glaciers. These flanking areas occasionally got glaciers. Here's another extent. So the middle part got several rounds and lots of advances and retreats in the northern part. So we have a lot of hilly morainal ter territory in the northern part. So we can have a lot of drier soils there and oaks could be important. But these soils are flatter and more moist, so maybe oaks not as important, and then oaks important in the hilly areas that haven't got as much glaciation, but got more erosion and more hillsides. How do we know what the forest was like before at the time of settlement in the US? Well, we know it mainly from the surveyors that laid out townships. Each township in the United States is six miles by six miles. And these folks walked to these township lines, marked the corners and other sections along the, the uh, townships. <clears throat> and that uh, is how we know what the forest was like in the early 1800s in Indiana. Here's an example of a witness tree, I, or I should mention that when they get to the corner of these sections, they would find a tree and mark it as a witness tree. And they would do that for one, two, up to four trees. They would measure the distance from the corner to the tree. So that's how we know how open or closed the forest were, how far they had to walk to get a tree. And they measured the diameter of the tree and they wrote down the species of the tree. So here <clears throat> over in Medewin National Tallgrass Prairie near Joliet, Illinois, they can, this tree was marked back in 1821 as a witness oak tree. We estimate it was 130 years old then, so that makes it now still alive at 330 years old. They took extensive notes about the terrain, so we have some really good ideas, and the state of Illinois has done a great uh, bit. I hope you're coming with me on this with the our, our because I couldn't get that optimized clip. Uh, can someone chime in and tell me whether they can see this map? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I heard a yes. All right, that's good news. But first of all, we can see that the more heavily wooded areas were parts of Northeast Illinois along the Mississippi River and down in extreme South. But let's look up in our area here. And again, I hope you're coming with here, but we can see where these witness trees are. So these, there were lots of oak trees in this area. And then this was mostly prairie because they didn't have any trees to mark. They would pile up some soil to mark the, the corners in a prairie. But we can click on these dots and we can see that they marked a white oak that was 12 inches in diameter and the tree is no longer present. There, somebody logged it out or died of another. Here's another white oak, 10 inches in diameter. Come over here by the uh, physics lab, a bur oak, 16 inches in diameter. No one's checked whether it's still there or not. One more, we can look at a white oak, 14 inches in diameter. So this is how we learn a lot about what the forest was like at the time of settlement. So here's a map in the center of the slide on, the uh, status of the forest in Indiana. So what we have here is a histogram that's rotated 90 degrees, showing how abundant the trees were. And this first map um, is dominant. Spencer? Yep. I think we actually were looking at the a different screen than what you were talking about. Sorry, I, okay, is that the one you were just talking about? <laughs> uh, no, no, it wasn't. Because you said you were so, clicking on things and things were changing. And that wasn't showing up. Okay, so. Yeah. My bad, I, I thought we were looking at this map and then I was like, wait, we can't click on that. <laughs> uh, hmm. Yeah, there's that, can you, uh, where I put the pointer, that's the map I was clicking on, but because I not able to uh, hit this optimize for video clip, I did that in the practice, but then I couldn't do it here. Does anybody know how to get that video clip? back on 
is it a separate screen or is it within PowerPoint? I mean, normally you just like I click this thing and normally I can click that too, but I wasn't able to do it. And I forgot how I did it in the practice. I don't want to take a lot of time, but we have some really cool videos or places to go to and I and I've forgotten. Yeah, I know you mentioned you had went into some of the advanced settings. So uh, thank you all for your patience as we try to show you some cool, uh, cool maps and interactive things. So <laughs> hmm. I wish I would have written down how I did that. Maybe it was under this more. Hmm. Well, I'm uh, since I'm forgetting it, I'm I'll I'll not uh, show the video stuff, but I'll tell you how you can find it. But we're back to the regular screen, right? Yep. Okay. We'll we'll carry on. Thanks for your patience out there. But in this map, we can see that the surveyors found that in that central flat kind of moist area of Indiana, that's almost all farmland today, beech and maple were dominant. And they occasionally were dominant in lower lying areas in the south, but not very often dominant in the northern morainal areas. If we look at oaks and hickories, we see that oaks and hickories were more abundant in the normal uh, northern morainal areas and around the prairie peninsula here. A lot of oak woodland and savanna along the prairie here. And then parts of the south, wherever it was drier and hillier, they were dominant, but not in this wedge. And we can see that overall, Indiana had this amount of forest originally, some open areas in the southwest, the prairie peninsula grading into savannas in this area. And we know now that that's how we come up with a map like this, being that Indiana was 90% forest. This says wetland, but that really means prairie by and large. And we can see that today it's much reduced in the amount of forest. Well, we can extend that surveyor's analysis to other states like Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana, and Illinois. And we can see on this first graph the density of trees that we can estimate from how far they had to go to get a tree and all that that to, to mark. And we can see that as you move from the prairie to the savannas into the woodlands to the forest, the density of trees increased. A big exception was southern Michigan. There was a lot of beautiful open oak woodland and savanna down there that's nearly all gone. Then we can see that that uh, wet, damp uh, central area had a, a lot of, of stems. Here we have the basal area, which is estimates from those diameter uh, estimates that they had on the trees. So we can see the biggest trees were in central Indiana, parts of lower and upper Michigan and Wisconsin. And when you combine these together to biomass, we can see that the most majestic forest in the Western Great Lakes was in central Indiana. They had the biggest trees and the most dense trees in that area, but Unfortunately, nearly all that forest was replaced by urbanization and farmland, but there are still a few sample forests left. Some people might say, what about those giant white pines of northern Wisconsin, Michigan? And there were some big white pines there, but they tended to be scattered in the landscape. Their Hartwick pines is kind of an anomaly where they're dense together. Most white pines, the giant ones, were spread out in the landscape. So we got to look at the question about how oaks became abundant at the time those settlers came. So in this schematic, we see this is the settlement time forest as the settlers moved from the East Coast to the Midwest. And oaks were a big part of over half the forest. Even today, we have still have about or regrown about 200 plus million acres of forest in the East. And about half of that had a significant oak comp. Component. So this diagram says what was the status in the forest in pre-colonization 1700. That's really for the East Coast. By the time you get to the Western Great Lakes, this is more like 1800. So you got to kind of mentally cut and paste that. But in order to figure out why oaks were so common and big and massive in those early forests, we have to take a 500 year view of how it is that the forest came to be like it is. Now in the, in the US, we can't nor, normally take that kind of view. We wanna know when inflation's gonna come down. Is it yesterday or today that it's gonna come down? But to understand oaks, you really have to have a 500 year view.
And oaks have to be able to recruit into the canopy. So here's a canopy oak, so it has to flower and make acorns. The acorns have to germinate into seedlings. And then the big bottleneck is going from the ankle high seedlings to tall or more leafiose, foliose uh, saplings that can recruit into the forest. They have to be able to complete that life cycle and they need a fair amount of sun. We have some hint that those early forests based on the surveyors were kind of open like this grainy black and white photo that let sun in for oaks to recruit. So many of these areas that have such a high oak component were probably fairly open. So how did they get open like that? Again, going back to the 500 year view. So in Indiana or Michigan or Wisconsin, they were doing a lot of, of the uh, survey work in the early 1800s. So we're gonna go back to the year 1300. And in the year 1300, sometime, maybe it was the 1340s, several of these natural factors came together. The forests were naturally burning periodically or the Native Americans were burning. Maybe in the 1330s, there were a couple of fires and then also associated with drought that killed some trees. Maybe five years later, there were some native insect outbreaks that defoliated some trees. And then maybe in 1341, there was a big ice storm in this putative woods we're talking about. So in a 10 or 15 year period, four of these factors came together and helped open up the forest so that oaks could regenerate. That might have been 1340, maybe it happened again in 1450, then it happened in 1520, then it happened again in 1630, 1740, and by the time the surveyors came in 1800, they, there had been several of these periods at about century intervals that opened up the woods even more than normal such that oaks could recruit. And since oaks can live for 200, 300, 400 years, they can dominate the forest with those periodic uh, recruitment periods. The Native Americans helped out. They were doing most of the burning and they had many reasons for burning. We won't go into all those here, but they did some agriculture. They opened up the woods, did uh, agriculture, then they would abandon those sites and they'd be kind of open oak woodlands. They would open up the woods around villages. So they added to these four factors. Other factors that may have contributed, passenger pigeon was so abundant that some people think that when they roosted in oak trees, they broke off limbs, thereby allowing more sunlight in. These factors that I talked about have to combine with a big oak acorn mast. A mast means a big production of acorns, and that only happens once every four or five years on average in nature. And also the mycorrhizal community had to have been natural at that time. The mycorrhizae in a nutshell are fungi that interact intimately with plant roots and they help the plants quite a bit and the plants help the, the mycorrhizal fungi. They probably contributed to oak recruitment. On the theme of mycorrhizae, I would urge you all at your earliest convenience to get out and read this book if you haven't already, Finding the Mother Tree by Suzanne Simard. This is another one of the top five nature books ever written. And it's about the forests in British Columbia, Canada, but she talks about and shows evidence for the mycorrhizal influence there. It's a it's a it's one of the most fabulous nature reads there is. And it appears that uh, some of her results apply to oak forests here in the Midwest, though we need a lot more data. We can estimate the frequency of fire by looking at old tree stumps where the fires partly healed up, the tree stump healed up. We can age the fire, 1784 a fire, 1797, 1826, 1840, 14 years later, nine years later, and so on. In there, these fires all came from the same direction, so they kept wounding the tree in the same place. So we're going to learn more about this, but that's basically how the oaks came to dominate. But then we came in first on the East Coast and then into the Western Great Lakes and basically slaughtered the forest in logging and left a lot of slash, which is cut up tree parts on the ground that caught fire and caused great intense fires. We also uh, grazed cattle in the woods, which degraded the system for many decades. We did no wildlife management, so we pretty much eliminated deer. But then we later on, as we get to the present, we let too many deer be there. And more recently, we've had non-native species 
mess with our systems. We'll see illustrations of that later on. And of course, in the last century, then fire suppression has been paramount in the Eastern US. And so that has made for declining oaks going into the future. Let's look at the fire frequency here. Based on thousands of these fire scars that people have analyzed, the red and oranges are fires that return every two to eight years. So in large chunks of the oak region, fires are at least every 10 years on average. As you go further north, they drop to 18 years or so, New England 30 years, but still that's significant fire frequency. So the oak systems of the Eastern US evolved with lots of fire. Let's just look at Michigan, for example. Several species are entirely dependent on fire in the northern lower peninsula. There's fewer species in the southern, but fire was still important down here. And of course, the upper peninsula, very important. The circles then indicate where we do prescribe fires now. So Allegan State game area here is a well-known fire dependent community. So they burn there a lot. The areas around Kirtland's Warbler, they burn there a lot, but most of the other fire areas hardly get any prescribed fire. So fire is mostly eliminated from the landscape. Now let's look at that aggressive logging that started around 1870. And the biggest culprit of that is Mrs. O'Leary's cow. You know, she burned down, uh, well, let's say it happened that way. The city of Chicago had a big fire, possibly because of her cow, and then we had to rebuild it. So we had to go up and log heavily in the Western Great Lakes area to rebuild it. And so you've seen pictures like this before. Amazing that these horses, even on snow, could carry that much weight. Unbelievable. Should have a holiday for those horses. And uh, anyway, so you can see how badly abuse the forest is here. We just went in and laid waste to it. Even some of this logging today is still done that way. Many hemlock trees were cut down just for the bark and the bark used to extract tannins to to, uh, to for leather goods. And so here's a whole bunch of hemlock bark and the trees were all just left in many cases out in the forest. So we were pretty brutal. We would build railroads into the woods to get the trees out. And there's all kinds of flammable materials right by these railroads. One spark comes out from this train and it's gonna start a really big fire. Here's some kind of contraption for moving logs around. I don't know what it, but you gotta believe this thing spewed out sparks too that started lots of fires. So we had the natural fires and then we have the slash fires in the eight, late 1800s and early 1900s and oaks can survive fire. They have a thick bark that helps insulate their vulnerable phloem, cambium, and xylem tissue from fire. And if the fire does penetrate the bark and kill some of that, they have a spectacular ability to heal their wounds or compartmentalize the damage. If the top of the tree is top killed, oaks can sprout new stems as we saw uh, from their roots. The oak leaves are designed to burn. Here's a view in an oak woodland just after this last heavy wet snow we had where the snow was so wet and heavy, I thought it would pack down the leaves into a damp monolayer, but the oak leaves have already, crump, uh, have already curled back up and they're ready to dry out and lots of oxygen in there to feed a fire. So it's really easy to burn oak woodlands. So oaks have thick bark for protection. They can compartmentalize injury. They're an aggressive sprouter if they're top killed. They're generally opportunistic because if there's disturbance, they can uh, recruit in there with more sunlight. Their fuel, their oak leaves promote fire. The trees themselves are extremely water efficient. Tap roots can get deep water, surf, uh, water sources if they can get down deep. They can extract water from dry soils and their leaves don't lose much water. So oaks are very fire and drought tolerant. Let's look, here's an oak tree that had a big conflagration around it during a, a fire and it probably, the bark is gonna have, help it survive. And if it did get wounded here, it'll uh, heal it over. So here's a bur oak from Missouri and 
the center part of the bur oak is kind of rotted out now, but we can look at the scars. We know there was a big fire in 1672, another one in 1691, another one four years later that was smaller, 1695, a smaller one, 1698, a bigger fire in 1720 made a big wound, but again, it healed over and started growing again. 1735, some other fires, they have been marked all the fires. This thing has, here's a fire out here that healed up real easily. So this thing has had probably two dozen fires and not every fire wounds the tree. Here's another one, several fire marks in here that were healed up. It, this was a pretty big fire, got kind of rotted it out, but it healed it up. Here's a fire scar. So this fire came in all different directions. Same with this one. But you can see the oaks can go on for a long life, surviving many fires. Here's a, a white oak cut down in the Indiana Dunes National Park. Uh, near Lupin Lane, if you've ever been in that area. And we can see that most of the fires came from the Southwest in this site. And we had a pretty big fire here that rotted out part of the tree, but it compartmentalized it and healed. And then it burned again in the same area a few years later, healed that over. Here's a medium fire. Here's a fairly big fire. Here's a small fire, maybe a small fire there. Here was a pretty big fire healed. It's in the process of healing over that one. Some smaller fires. Some of these might be a limb fell off of a neighboring tree and knocked the bark off. But still, we can see more than a dozen fires that survived. The odd one here is that for about 60 years early in its life, it never faced a scarring fire. There probably were fires, but they were low intensity. So these are mainly pine trees, but they do show the point of how uh, oaks are can nonetheless, even though those are pines, heal over. We can see the healing. And again, we can date the fires based on looking at thousands of these things. Here we can even tell what time of year the fire happened. So here's one, here's the dormant growth line of winter time. So then this is spring xylem growth. And there was a fire and then it started to heal up with summer xylem growth. See, it's a dip growth, it's a different color. So we know that this spring happened, uh, this fire happened at the transition from spring to summer. So around June 1st, we can date the fire. It might've been a hundred years ago, but we know it happened around June 1st. And I mentioned these sprouting from the collar. So here's a cigar diameter oak tree, probably a black oak, and it's sent up from the root collar, well insulated below the soil, orange stems. Oaks, very well, good to do that. Mark Abrams, one of the biggest oak fire ecology guys, maybe the biggest in the Eastern US. And he's standing next to an ancient oak tree that's had so many fires, they burned out the middle part of the tree, but it's still healthy and doing well. So these kind of fires are essential for oak recruitment and lack of fire puts too much shade in the system. At the Indiana D National Park, Indiana Dunes National Park, the Cowles Bog Unit, uh, they've been burning there for about 30 plus years or about 30 years and most of the fires have been rather cool but the one they had this past December was really hot and it will be great to go back there and walk around once the trees uh, get their leaves and see how much damage there was see if how well they're able to compartmentalize the damage or if these sassafras trees how they do it and so on it's going to be a great place to go walk around so again, we can age these fires, we can put them on graphs. So we see that this particular site had several fires in the late 1800s and early 1900s, but then Smokey the Bear came, no more fire. Fires, Smokey, no more fire. We can see when oaks recruit in this, at these four sites in Southern Ohio, the, the black uh, bars are when oak trees recruit back around 1850. The vertical arrows are, are known fires. There are probably more. We can see the oak trees recruit during the fire time, but the maples recruit once the fires are stopped. Same in this one, same here, and same here. Here's a site where we have trees that we can date back to 1700, and the open squares and the filled triangles are oaks. And we can see that up till about 1930, oaks recruited in to the system, and then it's been shade tolerant, fire intolerant species since the uh, fire suppression happened. This graph also, by the way, gives us a, 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 a clear picture of how hard it is to age a tree by diameter. So here's an oak tree that recruited in in 1910 and it's 60 centimeters in diameter today. Here's one that recruited in in 1750 and it's the same diameter. So you really have to look at the 
features of the bark, the crown of the tree, lots of aspects to it to age a tree without coring it or getting the rings for it. Here's another site, Coleman Hollow, trees recruiting back to the 1600s. The triangles are known major fires. The oaks are white oak, chestnut oak, red oak. They all recruit during the fire time in groups. Remember that 500 year thing? See, we have groups happening. South Savage, same thing. We stop fires uh, around the turn of the century, then very little oak recruitment after that. White Pine Hollow State Preserve, Eastern Iowa. I guess this is famous because it's one of the furthest uh, Southwest white pine spots. So there's a lot of white pine in the dominant tall trees, but the white oaks and red oaks are also abundant there. The co-dominant, just slightly smaller trees, a lot of white oak and red oak, but in the sapling and, and lower stages, no, virtually no white oaks or red oaks coming in, no recruitment. Look at Wisconsin oak woodland studied in 1950 and 2004. The, in 1950, red oaks, black oak and white oak were important values. This is factoring in diameter of the trees and stem density like we saw before. And 54 years later, they drop in abundance. Meanwhile, the shade tolerant, fire intolerant species all increased. Sugar maple, elm, black cherry, basswood, red maple, and box elder. We have, we can look at millions of acres. So they estimate that 10 million acres have white oaks dominating at the ages of 61 to 80 years old in the Eastern US. But there are hardly any forests where 30 year old or younger white oaks are. So as these older ones get harvested, remember the harvesting for whiskey barrels and that, and then uh, as they age and die, they'll move to the right in upcoming decades, cut and aging, and there's almost nothing to replace them. So we know we have to return some of these natural factors onto the landscape. Fire is the most important, but the problem is only a quarter of the forest land is, is uh, county, state, or federal owned or land trust, not much, only a quarter. The rest of it is privately owned by corporations and families. So to get millions of acres on board with restoring oaks is gonna take a very uh, complex network of activities. One, I think this might be the last one looking at the changeover and we have Indiana forest, Mississippi and Kentucky. In the overstory, the fire trees are dominant in the oaks, but then as you get smaller and smaller, they're hardly present. Mississippi, there's a lot of seedlings, but they don't make it to the 10 foot tall stage. And then in Kentucky, a lot of seedlings down at the ankles, but they don't make it to the 10 foot stage there. So the, these are more data showing that the oaks are in trouble. So at the time of settlement, the forests were kind of open with a high diversity of grasses, forbs, and shrubs. And this was an amazing ecological network, as I've been pointing. Then we cut it over massively, first in the East Coast, moving west uh, toward the mid Midwest here. And it turns out oak did re-sprout easily from this massive cutover. But since most oaks today aren't multi-stemmed that are old, a lot of acorns came in as well. So oaks did well, especially with the 1930s being hot and dry. The oaks made it through the 1930s very well. But then we, we did the fire suppression. Now the lower plants are almost gone. It's just leaf litter now. And there's so little light that oaks can't recruit into the system. It's shade tolerant species. And we've had this process that I'll explain here is mesification. The, the forest has become moister and more cool as we suppressed fire. We'll see that. So Smokey the Bear was invented right here in 1942, I believe. About 10 million acres of forest would burn in the eastern U.S. in an average year. And you can see Smokey the Bear did his job. So the importance of fire is uh, present in the in the earlier years and it allowed oaks to dominate, but then we stopped fire and the shade tolerant, fire intolerant species increasing. And maples in some areas are big in this, beech in other areas. Let's look at how maples hurt chance for fire when they, when they come in and take over. Oaks tend to have rather shallow and open crowns 
whereas maples and beech tend to have very thick, wide ranging crowns. And so we can see the crown volume is very low in white oak and chestnut oak, but in red maple, sugar maple, American beech, very big, and they don't let much light through. The mesophytes, the shade trees, let only half the light through that oaks do. So that keeps the forest moisture doesn't dry out as much. The oak bark we've already learned is thick. The mesophytes is thin and smooth. We have the bark thickness over here. And then we have the amount of water that runs down the stem. Oaks tend to, uh, the bark tends to absorb all the water, so not much runs down the oak stem, whereas the mesophytes with their smooth, a lot of water runs down the stem, so the soil's very wet there. If it does burn, it's not very dry. How about the leaf litter? How fast does it decompose? It turns out that the oak leaf litter decomposes more slowly than the maple litter. The only exception to that is the beech litter decomposes slowly. But there's more fuel with oak leaf litter because it doesn't decompose as fast. And then if you wet the litter, we can see that oak litter, when it's super saturated with water, dries off rapidly in a few hours, whereas the mesophytic species can absorb a lot more water and then dry more slowly. So that if it's no, if it's 100% uh, or if it's 100% oak litter, dries rapidly. If it's 100% non-oak litter, dries very slowly. And then it doesn't burn as well. So the oak litter burns very well. And some of the mesophyte litter doesn't burn at all. Lastly, in this, on this theme of, of reduced fire intensity or frequency, is that the or the fire, the forest that has a lot of mesophytes involved has very little in the way of grasses, as I've mentioned, forbs and shrubs. So the fire is not very hot, but a more open woodland has a lot of grasses and forbs and shrubs to add to the fuel and make the fire more effective. So the basic idea is you exclude fire and then the maples and the beaches come to proliferate. They create shadier, cooler, wetter, and lower fuel understory that's less flammable and that just feeds back and cuts down on fire. So now there are tens of millions of acres in the Eastern US that have so many mesophytes in them that fire is almost squelched in the system, even if we try to burn it. So oak seedlings can get started, but they can't grow into that kind of shade. We can look at the importance values. We've already seen white oak is very important in the ecosystems of eastern uh, U.S., but they're not. They're negative regeneration index throughout the whole site. They're being logged out or dying of old age at a faster rate than they're recruiting. Same is true for the red oak, but red maple has positive regeneration index and sugar maple mostly positive as well. Well, let's get out into uh, the nature preserves and really get a, go for a whole bunch of nature walks here. And we can read so much into the woods. We've seen all these studies, but we can do it. There, there are so many of them, we can read them ourselves. So here's Sunset Hill Farm County Park in Porter County. And we can see a lot of tall oak trees in the woods. And these are a bunch of sassafras here. But in this little scrubby wooded area, we have oak, young oaks that are recruiting in. So on the edges of woods or when they're associated with scrubby areas, sometimes oaks can recruit in. And we can see this with our eyes because young oak trees up to about this height do not lose their tree, their leaves in winter. This is called marcescence. And it's thought to have evolved back when we had megafauna feeding on twigs of trees and these sloths and woolly mammoths didn't want to eat all those leaves with the twigs, so they left the oaks alone. Oaks evolved marcescent. So you can see where oaks are recruiting just to look by looking for marcescence, but you have to remember that beech trees are marcescent and hop hornbeam or ironwood are marcescent, but beech are fainter in color hop hornbeam, there aren't many leaves on, and they're kind of rusty color compared to the oaks. So here's uh, oak, a whole bunch of oaks regenerating right in this area. So they're gonna hold those leaves all winter, but in this woodland, there's no marcescence, so no oak regeneration. So we literally have tens of millions of acres in the Eastern US that are get undergoing this mesification. We have giant oak trees in the canopy, but we have such a dense layer of fire intolerant, shade-tolerant species such as sugar maple that they've eliminated the lower vegetation and make it very hard to burn. 
So a lot, no oaks can regenerate there, but here's a site where they've been burning and they've opened it up and we're gonna get oak recruitment there. So what do you do? The idea is you could thin the forest some and do prescription burns. But if you don't come back and keep looking at the site and trying to analyze for those multiple factors I talked about, you'll get shade tolerant species dominate. But if you think about it over the decades, you'll be able to regenerate the oaks back when it was natural in the 1300s and so on. The Indiana DNR has a plan for how you can do this. They call that the oak shelter wood and burning harvest uh, method. So here we have an open oak woodland. So they take a spot that's mesified with lots of marcescent beaches here and down here and burn the site, do some logging on it to thin out the trees and then come back and repeat these things. And you can get a more open natural woodland in those sites. So they want us to get away from the excessively shady forests. Some were always that way, but not all of them, and open up the woods. That's going to help oaks be useful for more insects and birds. It's going to improve the herbaceous layer and shrub layers for wildlife and us. So again, these areas with lots of young maple trees, just as they're greening up, no oaks can recruit. It's hard to burn that area, So we have, but we somehow have to get fire back on those sites. Oak is still important in many areas, but it's being logged and not replacing itself uh, because of the mesification. If we open up those forests, we can get a diverse herbaceous layer like these pictures show. And I, this is where I wish I could show you the, the, uh, the video on. I'm sorry that I couldn't get the video link to, to activate, but I would urge you to go to the Lake County Forest Preserve District website of Lake County, Illinois. And they talk about how they're taking these nature preserves and opening them, opening them up. If you look for their oak, opening, oak, oak woodland uh, page, you'll find a video on there that'll practically bring you to tears how well it's done. And they'll talk about this kind of thing, how they're getting the oak, the oak forest back natural again so that oak saplings can grow up. There's my link to it, but I don't think I'm going to go there. I'll be able to go there today. Sorry about that. But I urge you all to do it. It's a four or five minute video and it's stunning. We got to hit the uh, briefly the other major problem that oaks have, and this is the non-native species. And uh, we don't need to show a lot of pictures because these pictures tell it all. So here's Waterfall Glen, a 2,500 acre nature preserve in DuPage County. The canopy is a great oak woodland, but Asian honeysuckles have invaded and filled the understory over hundreds and hundreds of acres, and they've obliterated any life underneath the oak trees there. And they're working hard. One of our former students is working for Santec now, and They've opened up a lot of woods. He said they did 30 more acres this weekend. It's laborious work. We can see how beautiful this open oak woodland is, but we can see in the background the Asian honeysuckles waiting to reinvade. Hopefully, Patrick got on that section there. Now, let's conclude here by going on a big nature walk through a bunch of sites. Uh, and look at what the oaks can tell us about their health. And we'll go to Ambler Flatwoods first near Michigan City, a Shirley Hines property. We see a big white oak here, a big red oak back there, a couple of maples here, maybe a big red oak back there. So we know that this old woodland was 140 years ago, had some significant openings. There's no oak recruitment today in here, but there were openings. 140 years ago or thereabouts. So maybe there were some storms that knocked trees over. We'll see that Ambler has a very wet soil, so it's hard for oaks to put their roots down deep, so storms can blow them over. There could have been a natural defoliation. There could have been some fire there, although it would have probably been cool due to the moist soil. And there could have been some select cut logging that allowed those oaks to get in. Near the wetland areas, fewer oaks usually, but here's a re red oak that grew at an angle all its youth. So it probably had only a very small opening in order to grow up. We can see that these openings are created by wind blown trees. And because the soil is so damp, it's hard for oaks like this white oak to grow its roots very deep. So they can be blown over fairly early, easily. Here's one within the last year that blew over. Here's one about four years ago that blew over. And this looks to me to be a hickory tree 
that looks like it's taking the gap. This is the most exciting things. We don't need to shed a tear over trees that blow down as long as they don't blow down in somebody's house. But we need to go out there and see who's capturing the gap if the gap is big enough to form one. And a hickory tree, which is a, needs a lot of sun, is getting that one. Here's one maybe eight years old. It doesn't look like there was enough of a gap for a tree to take it. Here's the famous one where uh, they put the, the sign up when it uh, uprooted about 2012. And here it is 11 years later, you can see it's mostly rotted and the soil that was brought up has formed a mound. So this is the classic pit and mound topography. Here's the pit where the tree's roots were pulled up from. And as the tree died, soil found, formed a mound. So pit and mound topography is very important to assess whether a site had much logging in the past, because if there's a lot of pit and mound topography, it probably means the site wasn't heavily logged. It takes about 150 to 200 years for the pit and mound to erode to levelness. So uh, you can see the pit and mound topography for a long time. If you're in New England, they call this cradle and pillow. You can choose whatever you like, cradle and pillow or pit and mound, doesn't matter to me. Here's an old one in, in Ambler Flatwoods. We can see the mound right here and the pit right here. So this is one that's at least 100 years old. So when the tree fell down to the right here, a black cherry seedling got in the gap of they need sunlight. So this black cherry now is about 100 years old. And we can tell that it germinated on the edge of the, pit, of the mound from a tree that fell down around 1920. We go to Lydic Bog next, not the bog itself, but the woods. Nature Preserve, and this is another Shirley Hines site. And uh, Steve Sass left, uh, led a wonderful New Year's Day hike there this this um, past uh, January first. And as you walk through those woods, you can see giant oak trees like this white oak and a red oak there. There's a beech tree back there, and oaks are the dominant tree there. Even though about 20 years ago, many of them were logged out before Shirley Hines owned it, but still oaks were dominant in that area. But you see, as you walk through that entire nature walk with Steve, not a single marcescent oak anywhere in the woods itself. So there's zero reproduction in the woods of oaks. That are there. We logged out a bunch and all the rest are just waiting out their time as they die. That's it for oaks there. That on the edge, a few may make it on the edge of fields, but here's a summertime view. We can see a giant red oak here and a white oak there and so many mesification trees going on. There's no way for the oaks to recruit into that. Here we have a red maple doing just fine, being one that's taking over as a, a shade tolerant fire intolerant species. Go to Ritchie Nature Preserve and other Shirley Hines. We can see the same thing, some ancient oaks that are not recruiting at all in there, but we know that 150 years ago, there were openings in those woods, maybe select logging, maybe wind throw, maybe something like that. We, If we estimate the age of these red oaks, we find they're the same basic age as red oaks in other nature preserves in Porter County. So we know that Prior to Chelberg Farm and prior to the Bailey Homestead, there were openings in the woods that were allowing oaks recruit. This is at the tail end of the Native American phase of establishment. At uh, Lydic Bog, we have a, a red oak that's not very wide, but deeply furrowed. It has been growing slowly and now it has a sugar maple right next to it. Here's an old ancient pit and a mound almost worn down. So this is from a tree that fell down, not this one, but in this direction 150 years ago. White oak and red oak, the oldest ones near the edge of the wetland areas along Coffee Creek. They got a little more sun there. Some tulip trees that require sun must have had some openings. Again, a, an old red oak there. Let's go to Indiana Dune State Park quickly do these nature walks here. We'll go on trail two and we see this white oak with a gazillion low branches 100 or more years ago. So we know this woodland in 1900 was much more open. We can see uh, an old mound and a pit here and then a new mound right adjacent to it is forming with that one. We can see red oaks right there and white oaks all around, but no marcescence. We can see a red oak that stump sprouted here. Now, if you collapse your the tree down to when it was just a small tree, the center of the tree goes here, 
and this one comes here. So they were about a foot apart. So that probably means that the site was logged. It's hard to burn an, a foot wide tree and kill it. So I think the site was logged and Tom Post agrees with this sometime after the Civil War. Here's another one where the, the sprouts are fairly far apart, probably from a logging, same with this one. Maybe this was around 1875, somebody cut the tree down, it sprouted. A bit. When a red oak or any oak gets really wide, like two feet, it can't sprout anymore if you cut it. So whenever you see trees that are downed, check out the rings and learn from them. We can see a red oak here that grew very fast for its first 20 years of life, and then it gradually got slower as the rings narrow down. When you age the tree, you'll see these white and dark bands. Those are spring and summer wood, so though that's not two years growth. So only count the light colored rings or the dark colored. Don't count both of them, you'll, get, you'll overestimate the tree's age. But if you get to the other part of the trail, you can see where they've been doing burns and you can see some marcescent oaks coming in, whereas other areas that aren't burned, no marcescence. Go quickly into Michigan, Ross Coastal Plain Marsh. Now this is an area that doesn't look like it burned all that often. So it was probably always mostly a mesic forest, but there are places where beech trees look like they stump sprouted. So I would say there was a fire here about 1850 that top killed a young beech tree and it stump sprouted. Here's one with three sprouts coming up and see how they all come close together here. That was probably a fire that killed a narrow, beech tree in 1850 and its stumps sprouted from there. But this oak, red oak, they're further apart. So that was probably a log to tree. Same with that one. At Ross Coastal Plain Marsh, they had a big micro burst in August of 2020 that knocked down a bunch of oak trees. So the big excitement was, could this help regenerate oaks? The problem is none of the other factors were operating. No fire, no insect defoliation no other factors. So there were no oaks ready to take advantage of it. Two years later, you visit the site, there's a whole bunch of blackberry brambles there, but I didn't see any marcescent oaks. It's hard to move around in that wind blown site, but uh, it looks like oaks were not ready to take advantage of it. Some sites were always more mesic, such as this state forest in Southern Indiana. We can see giant beech trees. That was probably not a big fire area, nor was this low lying area, but here's a, an oak in the valley. Maybe there was some kind of fire disturbance. Here's a red oak right next to some giant beeches. There might've been some kind of disturbance that allowed that red oak to go or this red oak to recruit among these beaches. Let's go into Illinois quickly. Messenger Woods, a great spring wildflower show. We can see that all of the canopy trees are oaks in this area. There's a red oak that fell down, but then there are sugar maples starting to invade. Now, in some of the lower moisture areas, there are adult maples, but they're spreading. So they've been burning these woods and trying to open them up. You can see the charred wood here, an oak that got a wound there because of the hot fire. So they're trying to open up those woods. Again, count the rings to look at the dynamics of the system. We can see a couple of bur oaks here. This red oak was about 150 years old on the rings, but here we have sugar maples moving in in various areas. This area, here's a, an adult sugar maple. So this might've been an area that did naturally have sugar maples, but then you get to drier areas where they're opening them up. I would expect to start seeing marcescent oaks in this area in the not too distant uh, future as they've opened up some of the area. Here's a, a basswood tree that appears to have stump sprouted. And again, look at all Take a moment on your nature walks and look at the rings and try to look for fire marks, which may or may not be present and, and how fast they grew. The oak woodlands, I forgot what preserves these are. I think they're the Palis preserves in southwest suburbs. You can see ma magnificent oak woodlands and you can see marcescence here. So they're recruiting in these five, four areas where they have burned the site. Thorn Creek Nature Preserve starting to get opened up a little bit of marcescence. We can see in there a giant red oak here. This shows us that there was cattle grazing for a while at this before it became a nature preserve. This was a shade tree for the farmer to have his cattle keep cool on a hot summer day. And then it became a nature preserve and trees grew around it. But this tree and that white oak were cattle shade trees, almost certainly. But we can see some marcescence in here where the oaks are recruiting. Red oak that again, 
uh, kind of struggled to get light in it, an opening here where a tree broke off and other fires have opened it up. We can see some marcescent oaks in that opening. We see the fuel bed. Remember the grasses and forbs in the lower store. If you open up the woods a little bit, they start growing to give more fuel. Here we have some marcescent oaks coming in. Uh, I did have a video for a woodland prescribed fire. Not going to go there. Here's some marcescent oaks in an opening where the woodland has been opened up. Hickory Creek Barrens in Will County is spectacular. But here's another cattle grazing tree. And we can see that cattle were here for so many decades that they kind of made what came back from the seed bank, mostly weedy goldenrod. So they've had to add seeds to improve the herbaceous layer. But here we can see a uh, uh, Hickory Creek area where the sugar maples are moving out from their refugia and taking over the oak forest, the oak woodland that was there, another cattle grazing tree, and the maples coming in there, moving along. We can see the maples are starting to come into this oak woodland. Here they've really ensconced themselves in, in these oak woodlands. Goodenow Grove Nature Preserve has a special surprise for us. It has some marcescent oaks in opening up in Will County again. Some trees that have been falling down, opening up areas. There's a marcescent branch of an oak tree there. Here's an oak that fell down and a marcescent oak there. And then they burned part of it. So we, we got to get out uh, from November 15th till March. We got to get out and that's got to be a big nature time for us. Most of our winter days are kind of mild, it seems, nowadays, so we can get out and look at these woods and really see into them and tell what people have been doing. We can see their burns and how effective they may be here. They're, it's still smoldering a little bit. We can see a recently cut bur oak here that was estimated to be, I forgot how old, but, it, but the rings were really telling. And then last, Nature Preserve, we go to Some Woods in uh, nature Preserve in Cook County Forest Preserve in Northbrook, Illinois. It's three nature preserves together, Some Prairie, Some Prairie Grove, and Some Woods. I'm showing you Some Woods because they're the ones that have the oak trees in them mostly, although they're in the grove too. These are the three best nature preserves, I think, in all in the Chicago area. Out of 400 nature preserves, I think that these are the three best. And they've had a spectacular volunteer base showing that all of us can get out there and help with these woodlands, opening them up and getting the natural herbaceous understory going again in these woodlands. There was nothing here 20 or 30 years ago, and they've opened it up a wet area with some cardinal flower. And I, I've only been to the Somme Preserves twice, but both times there were volunteers working there doing heroic work. I forgot their names. I'm so embarrassed to say, but they have been collecting seeds so they can spread herbaceous species throughout the open oak woodland to help it prosper in upcoming decades for them to enjoy, but their grandkids to enjoy. And we close then hitting on the notion that getting these woodlands and forests restored helps a lot of different organisms. We, I think I've hammered that uh, quite intensely. But I, I want to show you one last example of how important this woodland burning is. And we're going to consider the collared lizard in the hills of Missouri. Beautiful lizard. They like to live in openings in the woods called glades, which are the soil is so rocky and shallow, it's hard for trees to live there. So it's historically very open and the lizards love that to thermoregulate, get warm in. But Smokey the Bear came in <clears throat> and uh, with fire suppression, cedar trees started filling in the glades and basically there was no sunlight left. These open glades like this had turned to cedar glades, but they were very shady. And we were going to go see Google Earth where we could see all these glades through the landscape. But you'll have to trust that there are dozens of glades on these two mountain ranges in, in Missouri. And they decided that they needed to burn the glades to help uh, get rid of the cedar. And that helped the lizards some. But they later on, as we'll see in the data, realized that you have to burn the woods in between the glades as well, because they naturally burn. So here they are burning a glade, but then here they are burning the actual woods as well. So in, in 1984, we have this map of the Thorny Mountain Glades and the Steagall Mountain Glades. 
and the cholera deserts were gone from all of the sites because they were so filled in with mostly cedar trees. <clears throat> so they started burning the glades and they reintroduced collared lizards at this particular glade shaded in black. 10 years later, they had moved to two nearby glades and a few intrepid lizards had moved through the shady woods all the way to this glade, but there was not much expansion. This is when they realized that the, really all the woods burned. So they started burning the woods routinely and that would open up the woods, more sunlight. The lizards felt like exploring the neighborhood and they found new glades. Now I'm just gonna go through this year by year by year. And every time a new glade gets, gets colonized, you'll see a color come on. And so 10 years here, now I'm gonna go year by year. looks like Christmas trees lighting up. They even made it across the big gap here to Thorny Mountain. And by now they're in all the glades. So burning spectacularly helped these lizards. At first, they introduced them into just burning the glades and you can see their population size went up slowly, but then they started doing the prescribed burns and their populations exploded. They moved over to the other mountains and after burning there, they exploded. Number of occupied glades, as you saw in the Christmas tree lights, exploded. And of course, many flowering plants benefited from this burning. The dragonfly, a rare dragonfly was found in the area and it seemed to respond to the burning as well. So we've made it through uh, our presentation so that I conclude on the last slide from Leonard Wildlife Preserve in Lakeside, Michigan, just over the border, Chickaming Open Lands Trust. The next time you go on a walk and see majestic white oak trees, but no marcescence, and instead see all the shade tolerant, fire intolerant species, we know that time is just gonna run out on these white oaks and their ecological utility will wane over time and the forest, although pretty and eye candy for, eye candy for us with maples, it, maples it turns out are not very useful for wildlife. They're not zero, but they're not anywhere near the utility of oaks that were here naturally. So I conclude with that. Thanks for hanging with me. Gotta unmute. Um, wow, thank you, Spencer. Um, I am, uh, I learned a lot and I know everyone else has, and I know there's already some questions that are popping in the chat. So uh, do you want me to go ahead and read them off to you as I see them? Okay, I, I can see them too here, but I'll go with you on them. All right, I'll, I'll do one from yeah. Facebook. Um, and I think it's from a family oh. member uh, so, and it got asked on pretty early. Um, and you kind of addressed this earlier as well. Um, how well do oaks and maples coexist in the same ecosystem? And I don't know if you want to expand on what you were just kind of talking about, I guess. Well, some of those Illinois preserves, I think it was the Thorn Creek one, where the, the, the topography is rolling down in the moister sites. That's where the sugar maples are. And then as you go up the hill to the drier sites, that's where all the oaks are. So there's naturally going to be a little bit of an interdigitation there. So they can coexist as the fire regime lessens, they can coexist and then be sugar maples entirely. So I, I kind of painted it as a picture that it's either or, but there's a lot of gradient where they do coexist at low burn areas. Uh, and uh, that's where you'll see the most coexistence. All right. Um, also give a special shout out to Meadowbrook Nature Preserve. It does have a wide variety of, uh, there's all kinds of oaks here, but also um, all kinds of other trees too. So you want to kind of learn more about all the different, um, you know, Indiana trees. That's a great little hike to to take. Um, yes, I, I was going to put some pictures from Meadowbrook, but the show was already long. <laughs> <laughs> um, but full of information. Um, let's see, someone asked... How do black walnut and red cedar figure into the landscape, you know, past, present, future? Oh, well, I mean, the, the walnuts tend to be in low-lying stream areas like at Meadowbrook, 
Well, there's one up on the hill that's very old, but most of the walnuts are along the creek there where the fire intensity was not uh, very high. So they, they tend to be in the moisture areas that don't burn as much, the, uh, the walnuts. And I forgot what the other species was that was mentioned. Oh, was that red cedar? Red cedar. Oh, red cedar, it, it is highly susceptible to fire. So if you if red cedar is burned, the whole tree catches fire. <laughs> it's not just killing the bark. The whole thing catches fire. But they can recolonize after fire very well. Red cedar is most common in the poorest soil areas. And if you don't have fire, they can hang on in the poorest, poorest soils. And I, um, I'll throw in a question I was thinking about, um, because, you know, obviously in these forests where it's um, mostly oak, but obviously, you know, all kinds of different trees because yay biodiversity. Um, but like, how do those trees kind of adapt to those frequent fires, especially in the past? Well, some of them, you know, some of the even the shade tolerant or can stump sprout like beech can and red maple especially is prolific. So they're, they're they get, red maple can sometimes encroach into oak areas because they're almost as good at stump sprouting, but their stems are so vulnerable to fire that they always get set back. They can almost never when the fire is intense enough heal over a fire. Okay, um, as I'm looking at questions, I don't know if um, Dr. Courtright, you can send me the video to the Lake County, Illinois video. Someone on Facebook wants to know. So I don't know if you can kind of um, hopscotch that over to me um, in the chat or so forth. And also for the people on Zoom uh, as well. Um, and then- Yeah, I, I, I don't know if, how I can get it, but just do a, a search for Lake County Forest Preserve District, District Oak Woodland. Okay. It's it's easy to find on their web page and, and the video for a local entity, you know, not National Geographic or something, it's spectacular. All right, we'll have to check that out. Um, so many questions, this is so exciting. Um, can you talk about any oak pathogens? Oh, I was thinking about this too, that have been introduced in the Chicago and Dunes area. Um, uh, they live just north of Chicago and Evanston, and they just notice a lot of trees dying. And I know this has been in discussion, um, you know, with my peers as well. So, okay, yeah. So I, I, when I when I did the Asian honeysuckles, I was supposed to mention oak wilt, but forgot to put a prompt on the slideshow. But oak wilt is a non-native. Uh, uh, I forget if it's a fungal or a bacterial infection, but it gets. It's from somewhere halfway across the world and it's been introduced over here and it, it affects oak trees mostly in May or June. So if a branch gets torn off in a storm and then an insect brings the spores of this pathogen and infects the wound, it's almost a goner, especially red oaks. They say red are dead if they get the oak wilt, it's almost a guarantee. But another one of the drawbacks of introducing non-native species. But fortunately, it, it's been restricted in where it's been, but it could go haywire any time. But oak wilt is a problem. And then silky moths, non-native silky moths, uh, cause a lot of oak defoliation. But uh, Indiana DNR is fast to respond to, to a silky moth outbreak. OK. So many threats to oaks. Um, uh, Jake asked a really good question. Uh, what do you think are the most important things that we can do as individuals uh, or communities to, to help protect uh, oaks and keep them surviving? I think the main thing is to support the burning that goes on. We have to start letting some of the factors that operated historically uh, operate again. And, and we, we, we burn prairies readily. Everybody's on board with prairies and savannas, but not everybody sees the value in woodlands and forests to burn. We have to support that burning. We have to do it wisely to time it at the right time and all that, but we have to get that factor in. And then we hope that in upcoming decades, the other processes like drought occasionally, like uh, windstorms can come in and help open up the woods, but fire is what we have to uh, put back in. I'm not a big fan of the mechanical cutting of the woods like I described on the shelter wood cuts, because I don't think we should be sending machines out to tens of millions of acres. 
and cutting out large numbers of trees. I don't, I don't think that's the best way to go. But if you own land and want oaks to regenerate for future harvest, yeah, you got to do that. That's why the DNR put that handout, uh, made it available. But on most other forests, I, I just don't like the idea of cutting a lot of the forest as part of a shelter wood cut. And I see that some folks, Charlotte and Robert Wolf, are ready to to start thinning out maples wherever you think that they've encroached on a, an area that naturally would burn. That's when where we need to thin them out. Uh, and you know, so that we don't have to cut them everywhere, but wherever they are have moved in due to fire suppression. Hold on, looks like uh, my coworker Allison found the link to that uh, Lake County video uh, with more information too. So thank you for that. Um, oh my goodness, I can't keep up with all these questions, which is a good thing. Um, I don't know if you saw this question here about planting 150 seed, uh, of oak seedlings on five acres. Um, so like, I guess like how to protect them as they're growing from seedling to a mature tree with, you know, like a tree, you know, those like tree tubes or something. Well, yeah, there there is that option. You can get those plastic tubes that'll keep rabbits and other grazers from gnawing on the bark, and that, that should help. Uh, but I think a good thing to do is to come out to uh, Meadowbrook and walk through the fields and look at the trees that were planted. Uh, eh, gosh, eight years ago, I think it was, and you know, half of those trees got a tube, and half didn't get a tube because the tubes are expensive. And now they've mostly broken down, but you can go out there and walk through the fields and uh, just look at how well the trees are re re uh, regenerating. Now, you'll, they planted a bunch of maples, but they didn't survive very well, but the oaks and, and some others did. And you can get an idea how important it is to protect them or not protect them. But you do got to watch out for uh, ticks in the field. <laughs> so if you mm -hmm. go walking through those fields in uh, June or whatever, for a few hours, go home and take a nice hot shower for a long time and get those ticks off of you. Oh yeah, it's gonna be tick season soon enough. So uh, that'll be fun. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, Arrestus notes that they've had good uh, luck treating um, oak wilt with fungicide treatments. And yeah, it is a fungal infection. And it's fun because if like bugs and beetles you know, bite or, you know, chew at the oak, then they can spread it too. So it's like a double whammy. Um, all right. Yeah, and I've gathered the worst months for transmission are May and June. Earlier and later are not so bad. Also, someone else notes that ticks are already out. It is a lot warmer this year, early in the year than normal too, which is something else I'm sure we've all noticed. Um, uh, Doug is asking um, that we've noticed uh, a lot of plant diversity at Amber Flatwoods, uh, one of our nature preserves, of course. Um, would fire have been a not as periodic disturbance in that system or were there other disturbances that naturally would have been present? Yeah, I think in Ambler, the fire was less important because historically the water table was so close. Now there's been some drainage due to human activity in the past century, but I think it was such a moist site. I think the disturbance that was more important there was the tr trees falling down because the roots can't go very deep in the soil. So I think fire was less important and tree uprooting was more important uh -huh. at Ambler. I will also throw out if people on Zoom want to, uh, you know, like chime in and say their answers out loud. I don't know if that makes things faster, but I'll also kind of go back to Facebook because I've been, uh, there's some questions unanswered there. Uh, Amber is asking if the native landscape here in Chesterton uh, is majority oak woodland. Um, oh, yeah, is asking if the, the, the Chesterton forests are majority oak or not. I mean, if you see big oaks in a forest now, they might be 150 years old so that we know in 1880, they were a baby tree. So that means there had to be at least 100 year oaks present in 1880. So we know going back to 1780, oaks were a big part of the system. So you can, as long as the site hasn't been logged too many times, you, you can tell from the ages of the oaks how, how far back in time they go. And do you know if there's, because um, uh, we have some nature preserves in Chesterton as well, if there's any of those that are good oak habitat? 
Well, you know, even like uh, Chesterton High School, there's a little woodland right south of the high school. And that looks to me like there are some really old oaks there. So even though the school was built there, homes were built there, roads, fields, and whatnot, that little patch of woods suggests it was an oak woodland. And then some places like, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the preserve all of a sudden up on uh, north of Chesterton Feed and Garden Center there. There's some old oaks there too. So there are lots of oak woodlots, woodlands in the Chesterton area, no mm -hmm. doubt. That would be uh, Walner, right? Walner is that. it. Yeah. I almost said Walnut, and I said, no, that's not right. Walner. <laughs> oh, we could do another webinar on that. Um, okay. Uh, also going back to Facebook, are the six-lined race runner uh, lizards in the dunes in a similar situation, similar situation requiring fires for survival? Run, run that by me again. Are the six line race runner lizards in the dunes um, in a similar situ situation requiring fires for survival? Yeah, oh, yeah, because uh, they, they live out in the open dunes at West Beach, for example. And in many cases, the vegetation is so sparse that it's kind of hard to get fire to go through there. But in places where the vegetation has increased, it would help those lizards. But you got to time the burning right. You don't want to burn when they're on the surface. Because even though they run fast, they, they may have trouble with the fire. So it'd be better to burn after a cold spell when the lizards might have gone underground. Um, and then someone, um, and we had one of our staff reply to this, but just addressing, um, you know, does Shirley Hines burn their, pro uh, burn their preserves? And um, uh, Doug answered this in more detail, but uh, we do. Um, you know, we can only do it given, you know, the staff resources and things like that, but obviously we recognize that as an important part of this ecological cycle. So um, I know last fall we we did a couple burns and uh, hoping to do more. Yep. I hope the weather cooperates for sure. Yeah, yeah I had to wait for that too. <laughs> and and uh, going back to this person in the chat who asked about the tree tubes and then asked about burning, Again, it's 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 all a, you have to look at each example. Should you burn in advance of planting oaks, probably, to help prepare the the site for it. But then sometimes when the oaks are small, you, if they don't have enough uh, energy stored in the roots, if you burn, then it's going to be hard for them to sprout up again. So you have to really time the burning pretty well. I'm sure I've got all these questions answered. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for going back to that. I remember that being a two-parter. Sorry, I didn't address it all the way. Oh, so, yeah. And I so see like Allison the, found the, the three website. Years? Oh, so sorry. Give three, give three years, maybe, or four for them if we're uh, trying to, to get some oaks into our, you know, former prairie. So meaning, you're meaning burn at, after three or four years? Right. I mean, as far as letting them have a chance to get in there, we're going to get a lot of the aspens and things are going to start to come in. So we don't want to wait too long. Yeah, so that, that's that whole idea that you really have to look at the site. So you do one burn and see how the aspens and others respond to it. If they go nuts, it's not going to be a good idea to plant any oaks out there because they'll be overwhelmed by aspen and others. So it, it may take uh, some manual cutting in that case. It may take multiple burns and then you're ready to put the oaks in, which is a bummer because you have to, sometimes you have to wait a few years. Well, we've been burning it for about 20 years now. Oh, okay. But we have all this Korean lespedes and some other exotics and we're kind of almost saying maybe we should just start letting some oak, uh, oaks because they're already regenerating in there. Yeah. Well, as long as they can keep ahead of whoever they're competing with, they, they should be okay. But, you, you know, you don't want them to have the stump sprout too early in their lives. That's just sort of my gut feeling. And I do see that Allison put the link up. There's the woodland uh, page to go to Lake County Forest Preserve District.org slash woodlands. Real, really great video. 
also, um, do you mind if I switch to my other slide? I know we're probably wrapping up here anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like contact information um, and talk about, because um, I know I mentioned this webinar was recorded, so I'll let people know where to find that. Um, and if I can display my screen. Okay, so hopefully people can see that now. Um, I'm sure all of you will think of more questions as you're, you know, taking a walk in a nature preserve and you see an oak and you're like, wow, I have more questions. Uh, also, they're supposed to say thank you on there because I really appreciate everyone's time, uh, especially Dr. Courtwrights for um, presenting and answering all of our many questions and um, being with us today and being a wealth of knowledge. Um, as I mentioned, this webinar was recorded. It will be immediately available right after um, we end this uh, live stream. So uh, if you want to share your friends and tell everyone how cool this was, uh, you could do that as soon as tonight. Uh, if you're more of a YouTube, YouTube person, this will also be available in the next uh, few days or so. Um, we're trying to get all of our webinars on our YouTube channel um, and grow that library as well. And in general, if you have questions, I put um, our information on there, as well as the general Heinz Trust information. If you want to call our office about anything or check out more upcoming events, we try to do webinars. Um, you know, a few times throughout the year. And then, of course, the best way to, you know, go out and see oaks and all the other cool trees is on a, on a hike. So um, come have fun with us. Yes, very good. And if anybody has questions, you can send it, send me an email, send me a picture. I'll try to interpret it. <laughs>